Imagine waking up. It's cold. It's dark. You're in a car. It's filling with water. You're only three, and in your three-year-old mind, you don't really comprehend what's going on. You can't really figure out a solution to what's going on. You look over and you see your little brother in the car seat beside you. He's just over a year old. You start screaming and wailing because as a three-year-old, you don't know what to do. As you look to your right, you see your brother. And as you look to your left, you see your mother watching, standing off the boat ramp at John D. Long Lake. And you wonder, what could I have possibly done? Why isn't she saving me? My head is going under the water. I'm having trouble breathing and keeping my head up. And I look over and my mother is still standing there watching. I'm sorry, Mama. I don't know what I did wrong. Please help me. You can't breathe. Your lungs fill with water. And you know she's still watching. This is the horrifying case of Susan Smith. And we are the Lantern Keepers. It was a chilly and spooky night, October 25th in 1994 in Union County, South Carolina. Mercury was in retrograde. Just days before Halloween, there were decorations up of ghosts, apparitions, and scary characters. Kids were excited about the upcoming holiday and getting their costumes ready. Smells of apple cider, pumpkin spice, and hot chocolate filled the air. Unfortunately, two little boys three-year-old Michael and 14-month-old Alexander would not be able to take part in the festivities. For those boys, they need not be scared of strangers or apparitions, but the demon from the pits of hell they called Mama, Susan Smith. Those boys didn't survive that night. Their lives were snuffed out by the one that was supposed to love them, the one that was supposed to protect them. Their mother strapped them in their car, quietly closed the door and released the emergency brake as they slowly sank into John D. Long Lake. They died by drowning after the car took six minutes to fully submerge. With the tail end in the air and the nose down, they would have seen their impending doom of the dark black water they were sinking into. Screaming and crying would have surely been heard by the one they call Mama, as it was eventually found out she knew exactly where the car sank. It's been speculated that she turned the lights on to be able to watch it submerge. But let's back up for a second. Who was Susan Smith? Susan Smith was born Susan Vaughn on 9-26-1971. She was born into chaos and rarely had any sort of stability. She was the only daughter of Linda and Harry who were always fighting. Linda was a homemaker, and Harry was a mill worker and alcoholic. Even with all the turmoil, she was close to her father and would light up when he was around. Her father, Harry, committed suicide when Susan was only six years old. Susan and her two brothers were scared of their parents' fights. Her childhood was tumultuous with her half-brother, Michael, attempting suicide before she was of preschool age. According to one of her friend's mothers, Susan was a very unusual child in elementary and preschool, and she would often stare into space as if she wasn't there. In 1977, Linda, Susan's mother, divorced Terry. He took it badly, even though he was violent with Linda and constantly accusing her of cheating on him. The former firefighter turned mill worker took his own life five weeks after the divorce and there was nothing left to light up little Susan's eyes. Harry put the gun in between his legs, aimed at his stomach, and pulled the trigger. He was mortally wounded, but he didn't die automatically. Seven years later, Susan also attempted to commit suicide for the first time. Susan's mother remarried two weeks after her divorce was finalized. 
Her new husband, Beverly Russell, molested Susan from the time she was 15, and she continued sleeping with him up until almost the time she committed the murders. Bev later admitted to his sexual acts towards her at her trial and said the whole blame of the tragedy shouldn't be solely on her. Beverly Russell was an executive committeeman at his local Republican Party, state uh, Republican Party, and he was also on the board of the local Christian Coalition chapter. Although Susan had a highly dysfunctional home life, she was a good student throughout the years. She was a member of the Beta Club, which meant she averaged a B in her classes. She was a member of the Red Cross, math, and Spanish clubs, and she was voted friendliest female in her senior year of high school. She was even the president of the Junior Civitan Club and volunteered with the elderly and in the nearby hospital. In the summer of 1988, before her senior year of high school, Susan got a job as a cashier at the local Winn-Dixie, and she worked her way up to bookkeeper. In November of 1988, Susan Smith once again tried to commit suicide, but she failed and was hospitalized. Her managers were very understanding and allowed her to come back to work after her month of recovery. When Dixie is where she met her husband, David Smith. He was a stock clerk and was engaged to a longtime girlfriend, Christy Jennings. He and Susan began dating in 1990, and they decided to marry when they found out she was pregnant in 1991. They were married in March, only 11 days after David's 22-year-old brother died of Crohn's disease. Linda, Susan's mother, was worried that she would show and insisted that the wedding go on even with the death and sadness in David's family. Susan and David had a lot of tension in their marriage and separated many times due to infidelities on both of their parts. Another stressor was that David became Susan's boss at Winn-Dixie. They had their second child in August of 1993, and after recovery, Susan found a new job. She didn't want to see Tiffany Moss, who also worked at the Winn-Dixie and had become David's girlfriend while Susan was pregnant. Susan got a job at Cosno as assistant to the executive secretary for J. Carey Finley, the president and CEO of Cosno, and she enjoyed her responsibilities there. She coordinated flights, hotel rooms, sent cards, flowers, so her responsibilities were very different from those at the grocery store. During that time period in her life, she had a lot going on. She worked full-time at Cosno. She had a partial load of classes at USC. She had full custody of her two boys. And she was having sexual relations with at least three men. David Smith, her husband. Beverly Russell, her stepfather. And Tom Finley her boyfriend, who had just broken up with her. That's a lot on her plate. So what happened that fateful day, and who is Tom Finley exactly? Approximately a week prior to the murders, Tom Finley, one of Susan's sexual partners and prior boyfriend, gave her a typed letter that was dated October 17, 1994, explaining that they were not suited for one another. This tore at Susan's feelings of depression and loneliness and all of the darkness of her past was surrounding her. Tom Finley was a co-worker of hers and the son of the CEO of Cosno. He was in charge of the graphic design department there and he created the company's brochures. Being young and rich, he was quite the bachelor in Union County even though he was described as not very physically attractive. He grew up in an affluent suburb in Birmingham, Alabama, and he had a bachelor's degree from Auburn University. Susan began dating Tom, but later she and David tried to work on their marriage. Their last attempt at reconciliation didn't work, and Susan once again began dating Tom in September of 1994. She was in love with him and thought he would be her savior from her life of loneliness, but he had other ideas. He eventually broke up with her and thought she was too needy and possessive. Here is the letter that he wrote to her, breaking up with her. This letter was also found in her Mazda, 
along with her children, when it was recovered. Dear Susan, I hope you don't mind, but I think clearer when I am typing. So this letter is being written on my computer. This is a difficult letter for me to write because I know how much you think of me. And I want you to know that I am flattered that you have such a high opinion of me. Susan, I value our friendship very much. You are one of the few people on this earth that I feel I could tell anything. You are intelligent, beautiful, sensitive, understanding, and possess many other wonderful qualities that I and many other men appreciate. You will, without a doubt, make some lucky man a great wife, but unfortunately it won't be me. Even though you think we have so much in common, we are vastly different. We have been raised in two totally different environments, and therefore think totally different. That's not to say that I was raised better than you or vice versa. It just means that we come from two different backgrounds. When I started dating Laura, I knew our backgrounds were going to be a problem. Right before I graduated from Auburn University in 1990, I broke up with a girl, Allison, that I had been dating for over two years. I loved Allison very much and we were very compatible. Unfortunately, we wanted different things out of life. She wanted to get married and, ha and have children before the age of 28, and I did not. This conflict spurred our breakup, but we have remained friends through the years. After Allison, I was very hurt. I decided not to fall for anyone again until I was ready to make a long commitment. For, for my first two years in Union, I dated very little. In fact, I could count the number of dates I had on one hand. But then Laura came along. We met at Conso, and I fell for her like a ton of bricks. Things were great at first and remained good for a long time. But I knew deep in my heart that she was not the one for me. People tell me that when you find the person that you will want to spend the rest of your life with, you will know it. Well, even though I fell in love with Laura... I had my doubts about a long and lasting commitment, but I never said anything, and I eventually hurt her very, very deeply. I won't do that again. Susan, I could really fall for you. You have so many endearing qualities about you, and I think that you are a terrific person. But like I have told you before, there are some things about you that aren't suited for me. And yes, I am speaking about your children. I'm sure that your kids are good kids. But it really wouldn't matter how good they may be. The fact is, I just don't want children. These feelings may change one day, but I doubt it. With all of the crazy, mixed up things that take place in this world today, I just don't have the desire to bring another life into it. And I don't want to be responsible for anyone else's children either. But I am very thankful that there are people like you who are not so selfish as I am and don't mind bearing the responsibility of children. If everyone thought the way that I do, our species would eventually become extinct. But our differences go far beyond the children issue. We are just two totally different people, and eventually those differences will cause us to break up. Because I know myself so well, I am sure of this. But don't be discouraged. There is someone out there for you. In fact, it's probably someone that you may not know at this time, or that you may know but would never expect. Either way, before you settle down with anyone again, there is something you need to do. Susan, because you got pregnant and married at such an early age, you missed out on much of your youth. I mean, one minute you were a kid, and the next minute you were having kids. Because I come from a place where everyone had the desire and the money to go to college, having the responsibility of children at such a young age is beyond my comprehension. Anyhow, my advice to you is to wait and be very choosy about your next relationship. I can see this may be a bit difficult for you because you are a bit boy crazy, but as the proverb states, good things come to those who wait. I am not saying you shouldn't go out and have a good time. In fact, I think, she, I think you should do just that. Have a good time and capture some of that youth that you missed out on, but... Just don't get seriously involved with anyone until you have done the things in life that you want to do first. Then the rest will fall in place. 
Susan, I am not mad at you about what happened this weekend. Actually, I am very thankful. As I told you, I was starting to let my heart warm up to the idea of us going out as more than just friends. But seeing you kiss another man put things back into perspective. I remembered how I hurt Laura. And I won't let that happen again. And therefore, I can't let myself get close to you. We will always be friends, but our relationship will never go beyond that of friendship. And as for your relationship with B. Brown, of course you have to make your own decisions in life. But remember, you have to live with the consequences also. Everyone is held accountable for their actions. And I would hate for people to perceive you as an unreputable person. If you want to catch a nice guy like me one day, you have to act like a nice girl. And you know, nice girls don't sleep with married men. Besides, I want you to feel good about yourself. And, I'm, and I am afraid that if you sleep with B. Brown, or any other married man for that matter, you will lose your self-respect. I know I did when we were messing around earlier this year. So please, think about your actions before you do anything you will regret. I care for you, but also care for Susan Brown, and I would hate to see anyone get hurt. Susan may say that she wouldn't care husband had, had an affair, but you and I know that is not true. Anyhow, as I have already told you, you are a very special person, and don't let anyone tell you or make you feel any different. I see so much potential in you, but only you can make it happen. Don't settle for mediocre in life. Go for it all and only settle for the best. I do. I haven't, I haven't told you this, but I am extremely proud of you for going to school. I am a firm believer in higher education, and once you obtain a degree from college, there is not stopping you. And don't let these idiot boys from Union make you feel like you are not capable or slow you down. After you graduate, you will be able to go anywhere you want in this world. And if you ever want to get a good job in Charlotte, my father is the right person to know. He and Connie know everyone who is anyone in the business world in Charlotte. And if I can ever help you with anything, don't hesitate to ask. Well, this letter must come to an end. It's 11.50 p.m. and I am getting very sleepy. But I wanted to write you this letter because you are the one who is always making the effort for me. And I wanted to return to friendship. I've appreciated it when you have dropped me nice little notes or cards or the present at Christmas. And it's about time that I start putting a little effort into our friendship. Which reminds me, I thought long and hard about getting you something for your birthday, but I decided not to because I wasn't sure what you might think. Now I am sorry I didn't get you anything, but you can expect something from me at Christmas. But do not buy me anything for Christmas. All I want from you is a nice, sweet card. I'll cherish that more than any store present. Again, you will always have my friendship, and your friendship is one that I will always look upon with sincere affection. Tom. Now that we have a little background established, let's talk about that fateful day that she murdered her children. Everything was normal that morning. She got her children dressed and fed, dropped them off at daycare, and headed to work. By all accounts, she was a great mother to everyone. Around 1.30 p.m., she pleaded with her boss to leave early because she said she was in love with someone who was not in love with her. Her boss, Sandy Williams, asked her who it was, and Smith said, quote, Tom Finley, but it can never be because of my children, end quote. Around 2.30 p.m., she spoke with Tom outside of Cosno and explained to him that David, her husband, was threatening to expose some damning information. When Tom questioned her about it, she told him that he was going to expose her affair with Tom's father, J. Carey Finley. Tom's reaction was that of shock, and he explained to her that they could never be intimate again, but that they could remain friends. Later on in the day, Susan found Tom again to return a sweatshirt of his, but he did not accept it and he told her to keep it. She got her kids from daycare and headed to Hickory Nuts, which is the only bar in town at the time. She pulled in when Sue Brown, which is the marketing manager of Cosno, did, and she pleaded with Sue to head back to Cosno with her to speak to Tom again. 
She needed someone to watch her kids while she attempted to speak with him. He was frustrated with her at this point. She wanted to apologize to him for lying to him about sleeping with his father and wanted to just see his reaction to that. He quickly let her out of his office and she told Sue Brown she, quote, might just end it, end quote. She then drove Sue back to Hickory Nuts around 6 p.m. At some point before 8 p.m., Susan called Hickory Nuts to speak with Sue Brown, who was eating with Tom and a few other co-workers. Hickory Nuts staff brought Sue a cordless phone, this was before the days of the cell phone, and Susan asked Sue if Tom had asked about her. She told Susan that he did not. She served her boys a pizza dinner, and then around 8 p.m., she decided to dress her children placed them in the Mazda with no shoes on, and she began driving around Union, feeling lonelier than she ever felt. At approximately 9 p.m., Shirley McLeod was relaxing at her home and just finishing up Tuesday's release of Union Daily. As she read, she started hearing wailing sounds coming from her porch, so she turned the porch light on and opened the door to see what was going on, and there was Susan Smith just crying hysterically. She screamed for Shirley to help her and said, He's got my kids. He's got my car. Please help. Shirley led Susan into her home where Susan told her lie for the first time, that she was carjacked by a black man. Shirley had her son, Rick Jr., place a call to 911. At 9.12 p.m., the 911 dispatcher called for the Union County Sheriff's Office to send officers out to the McLeod residence. While awaiting the sheriff's office, Susan managed to calm down a bit and she proceeded to tell Shirley the night's events when Shirley asked. Susan told her that she was stopped at the red light at Monarch Mills and a black man jumped in and told her to drive. She asked him why he was doing this and he said to shut up and drive or I'll kill you. Susan continued and told Shirley that the man was giving her direction and she drove northeast of Union for about four miles until he made her stop right past the sign. Shirley confirmed that the sign was for John D. Long Lake, which was located several hundred yards outside of Shirley's front door. He told her to get out. He made her stop in the middle of the road. Nobody was coming, not a single car. She asked him why, why couldn't she take her kids, and Susan told Shirley that the man said, I don't have time. Susan went on to say that the man pushed her out of the car with a gun at her side. According to Susan, the man said not to worry and that he wasn't going to hurt her. And when he finally got her out, he said he wasn't going to hurt her kids. Susan described how she had laid on the ground as the man drove away, and both of her sons were crying out for their mother. After a while, she got up, ran, and stopped when she reached Shirley McLeod's porch. Susan then asked to use the phone, and she called her mother, stepfather, and David. Sheriff Wells showed up at this point, and he began to direct the search for the children. They were only a quarter mile from John D. Long Lake. Sheriff Wells and his wife, Wanda, were good friends with Susan's brother, Scotty, and his wife, Wendy. Sheriff Wells knew of Susan this way. He asked her to tell him what happened. He took notes, and he realized that he didn't have the resources to find the children, so he contacted SLED, South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, to get assistance they otherwise wouldn't have had. While the search was transpiring, Susan's family and friends gathered at the McLeods. Around 12 a.m., they moved to Linda, Susan's mother's house. The drive over was the first clue that something wasn't right with Susan at all. Susan rode with her husband, David, and she told him not to get angry, but that Tom Finley may come to see her. David couldn't believe what he was hearing. Their two sons were missing, and here she is worried about David becoming upset over her boyfriend rather than her being upset over the boys. Tom never showed up that night or in later days to visit. The next day, October 26th, Tom rang Susan to express his sympathy, and instead of discussing her children, Susan incredulously wanted to move the topic back to their relationship. He, of course, told her not to worry about their relationship, but about the children instead. This would be the only phone call she would ever receive from Tom Finley. October 26th was a busy day for all involved, with Sheriff Wells getting the investigation more organized and calling in SLED for assistance. 
Divers came in and searched John D. Long Lake. Helicopters were deployed and Sumter National Forest was searched. Wells also set Susan up with a sketch artist. Her initial description was vague, but then became more detailed as the sketch came along. She described him as a 40s black male with a dark knit shirt, cap, jeans, and a plaid jacket. That day, the Adam Walsh Center also became involved to assist with the search and they offered services such as media liaison. Margaret Frierson, executive director, and Charlotte Foster met with David, Susan, Bev, Linda, and Scotty, and they encouraged David to make a national plea for the return of his children. He was nervous, but he did. They also arranged for flyers to be printed up. They spoke at Bev and Linda's home for about 40 minutes when David and Susan were needed up at the sheriff's office. Margaret and Charlotte followed behind. While Susan was being questioned, Margaret and SLED investigator Eddie Harris helped David formulate a statement for national TV and news media. With his wife Susan by his side on the steps of the Union County Sheriff's Office, he said this, quote, To whoever has our boys, we ask that you please don't hurt them and bring them back. We love them very much. I plead to the guy, please return our children to us, safe and unharmed. Everywhere I look, I see their play toys and pictures. They are both wonderful children. I don't know how else to put it, and I can't imagine life without them, end quote. After the statement, David and Susan went back in for further questioning. Susan was interrogated for six hours. That evening, Sheriff Wells requested that David A. Caldwell, director of the Forensic Sciences Laboratory for SLED in Columbia, to interview Susan Smith. October 27th, David Caldwell drove to Union County and interviewed Susan Smith three times in the course of that day. What he found were many inconsistencies with her story. She had also failed her polygraph tests, whereas David passed his. She told Caldwell of the night in question that her son Michael had suggested going to Walmart, but then she later admitted that it was her idea to go to Walmart. She said she went to Walmart twice that evening, but investigators interviewed employees who said they never saw her, her children, or her car there. When investigators told her this, she then admitted that she just rode around for hours and was afraid to tell investigators that. She also told investigators that Michael suggested going to her friend Donna's fiance Mitchell's house. And this is the lie where the infamous stoplight story came into play. She said she stopped at the light at the Monarch intersection, but that there were no other cars on the road. Well, Susan, investigators know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're lying at this point because that light stays green and only changes when a car at the cross street stops and changes it. While Caldwell was interviewing Susan, David was telling other agents about her affairs. Agent Caldwell spoke to Susan about Tom breaking it off with her due to her children and asked, quote, Did this fact play any role or have any bearing on the disappearance of your children? End quote. Susan responded with a tell. She said, quote, No man would make me hurt my children. They were my life. End quote. This indicates that she knew her boys were dead by speaking about them in the past tense by saying were. Agent Caldwell really wanted to get to the bottom of why she didn't tell the truth about Walmart, and he discussed their fussiness by saying, quote, is that why you killed them, end quote? This enraged Susan. She slammed her fist on the table while saying, quote, you son of a bitch, how can you think that? End quote. Susan left the interview room yelling, quote, I can't believe that you think I did it, end quote. Agent Caldwell, Roy Pascal, the forensic sketch artist, and the FBI polygraph examiner all noted strange things about Susan. Agent Caldwell said she would be sobbing at points, but with no tears coming out of her eyes. The FBI agent noticed that she would make fake crying sounds without tears. Pascal said she was very vague in her description but then very detailed about certain things. None of it was adding up. The profile. The FBI was tasked with coming up with a profile of a homicidal mother, and lo and behold, the profile matched Susan Smith to a T. It was almost as if the FBI profilers had done a biography on her. 
The profile said that it would be a woman in her 20s, that she suffers from depression and suicidal thoughts when rejected by lovers at the time of the murders, that she grew up in poverty, that she was sexually and or physically abused, that she's undereducated, that she's enmeshed with her children and isolated. Filial homicide may occur when the mother has suicidal thoughts because she views her children as an extension of her rather than their own separate entities. Her expectations and isolation with the maternal responsibilities and self-destruction lead her to being enmeshed with her children. In the days following, Agent Caldwell came up with a profile of Susan Smith and described her as cunning and cool. He developed a list of questions specifically for investigators to ask her daily and made a game plan for the media. He wanted the media to descend upon Union to cause Susan Smith to confess. On October 28th, Sheriff Wells said they had not ruled Smith out as a suspect and said, quote, We do not have a car. We do not have the children. We do not have the suspect, end quote. On October 29th, the Union Daily wrote a story about Susan's discrepancies. The pressure was on. There was also speculation about two white children riding around in a car with a black man with no sightings. Agent Caldwell also scripted the movements and choreographed the agent's behavior when interrogating her to pressure her to confess. They all felt that she was culpable of the murders and that the car and the children had to be within a two-mile radius of the McLeod home where Susan made that first phone call. Finally, on November 3rd, 1994, Susan Smith broke down and confessed to Sheriff Wells. At 1.40 p.m., they met at the family center of the First Baptist Church, facing one another in fold-out chairs, knee to knee. Wells confronted Susan about all the discrepancies and told one little lie. You see, once she was confronted about the light issue at the Monarch intersection, she changed her story to the Carlisle intersection. Wells told her that he had undercover officers at that intersection that night and no one saw the alleged carjacker. Susan asked him to pray with her and he closed his prayer with this, quote, Lord, we know that all things will be revealed to us in time, end quote. Wells then looked up at Susan and said, quote, Susan, it is time, end quote. Susan dropped her head and sobbed. Quote, I am so ashamed. I'm so ashamed, end quote. She asked Sheriff Wells for his gun to commit suicide. Sheriff Wells asked Susan why she wanted to do that, and her response was, quote, you don't understand. My children are not all right, end quote. Other agents entered the room, and they obtained her written confession. The following is a transcript of Susan Smith's handwritten confession to drowning her two-year-old son, Michael, and 14-month-old son, Alex. Her statement was released November 22, 1994. When I left my home on Tuesday, October 25th, I was very emotionally distraught. I didn't want to live anymore. I felt like things could never get any worse. When I left home, I was going to ride around a little while and then go to my mom's. As I rode and rode and rode, I felt even more anxiety coming upon me about not wanting to live. I felt I couldn't be a good mom anymore, but I didn't want my children to grow up without a mom. I felt I had to end our lives to protect us from any grief or harm. I had never felt so lonely and so sad in my entire life. I was in love with someone very much, but he didn't love me and never would. I had a very difficult time accepting that, but I had hurt him very much, and I could see why he could never love me. When I was at John D. Long Lake, I had never felt so scared and unsure as I did then. I wanted to end my life so bad and was in my car, ready to go down that ramp into the water. And I did go part way, but I stopped. I went again and I stopped. Then I got out of that car and stood by the car, a nervous wreck. Why was I feeling this way? Why was everything so bad in my life? I had no answers to these questions. I dropped to the lowest point when I allowed my children to go down that ramp into the water without me. 
I took off running and screaming, Oh God, oh God, no, what have I done? Why did you let this happen? I wanted to turn around so bad and go back, but I knew it was too late. I was an absolute mental case. I couldn't believe what I had done. I love my children with all my heart. That will never change. I have prayed to them for forgiveness and hope that they will find it in their heart to forgive me. I never meant to hurt them. I'm so sorry for what has happened, and I know that I need some help. I don't think I'll ever be able to forgive myself for what I've done. My children, Michael and Alex, are with our Heavenly Father now, and I know that they'll never be hurt again. As a mom, that means more than words could ever say. I knew from day one that the truth would prevail, but I was so scared I didn't know what to do. It was very tough emotionally to sit and watch my family hurt like they did. It was time to bring a peace of mind to everyone, including myself. My children deserve to have the best, and now they will. I broke down on Thursday, November 3rd, and I told Sheriff Howard Wells the truth. It wasn't easy, but after the truth was out, I felt like the world was lifted off my shoulders. I know now that it's going to be a tough and long road ahead of me. At this very moment, I don't feel I will be able to handle what's coming, but I've prayed to God that He give me the strength to survive each day and to face those times and situations in my life that will be extremely painful. I have put my total faith in God and He will take care of me. Signed, Susan V. Smith, 11-3-1994, 5.05 p.m. Sheriff Wells then had the terrible task of confirming the whereabouts of Alex and Michael and break the news to the family. After nine long days, the investigation was over, but the heartache was not. In fact, some of the details are so daunting that it's hard to fathom a mother could do something so cold-blooded. During the trial, it was revealed by one of the divers, Morrow, that when he was circling the car, he saw a tiny hand against the window. Autopsies on November 4th revealed that the boys were alive when the car was submerged and that they drowned. That same day, Susan wrote David a letter and repeatedly told him she was sorry, along with whining how her feelings were getting lost in the wake of everyone else's. This and her written confession made David contemplate what kind of person she really was. Who did he marry? David also found out at the trial that Susan told investigators exactly where to look for the car, leading him to believe that she sat there and watched until her sons died. With experiments, it was found that it took six minutes for the car to fully submerge. Another chilling revelation was that the car lights came on when the car was flipped over. To David, it meant the unthinkable, that Susan intentionally left the lights on so she could see the car sink down the whole time. The Trial Susan Smith was represented by David Brooke, and Linda and Bev had to mortgage their house to pay for him. At that time, Brooke had only lost three cases out of 50 to the death penalty. Bev and Linda felt very confident in his abilities. The prosecutor in this case was Tommy Pope, the youngest prosecutor in the state of South Carolina at 32 years of age. Brooke proposed a plea deal to Pope asking for life in prison without the eligibility of parole. Pope rejected it and sought the death penalty but was unsuccessful. Brooke's strategy was to have the trial in Union rather than away from Union to get the sympathy from the small community. He had noticed that the racial tension had turned into prayer vigils for her, and that many thought she was mentally ill rather than evil. And he was right. The jurors eventually sentenced her to 30 years in prison, and she is eligible for parole in November of 2024. Before the trial, Bev and Linda divorced, and David's divorce from Susan was finalized. He was given the Mazda, and he destroyed it. In June, on Father's Day, Susan received a letter from Bev, apologizing to her for molesting her and taking partial blame of the tragedy by saying, quote, My heart breaks for what I have done to you. Russell also wrote that, I want you to know that you do not have all the guilt for this tragedy, end quote. A couple of days before the trial, 
Susan's pastor, Mark Long, announced that Susan had undergone a conversion and was baptized. Right, how convenient, were my thoughts, and apparently many in the community felt the same. The trial was short beginning on July 10th, 1995, and ending on July 22nd, 1995. It's noted that Judge Howard did not allow the jury to see the photos of the children after coming out of the lake because he felt it could cause a prejudice, and he disallowed the prosecution to present their full case. One shocking moment was when Judge Howard allowed the defense motion to allow the jury to consider a charge of involuntary manslaughter, and that only carried a penalty of three to ten years. The jury deliberated for only two hours and came back with a verdict of guilty of two counts of murder. The jury was brought back for the penalty phase, and they rejected the death penalty. Judge Howard handed down a sentence of 30 years to life in prison with the possibility of parole. 30 years has almost passed, and Susan Smith has a new boyfriend while behind bars. They write one another letters. A family member of Susan's said that Susan wants to get out and lead a normal life. Her ex-husband David is making it his life's mission to ensure that she stays behind bars forever. On a personal note, I take my two youngest boys to John D. Long Lake frequently. It's serene and beautiful. The road to get there is winding and wooded, kind of like a mountain road. But the history is so hard to shake when you're there. One of my sons is currently three years old, and I cannot imagine watching him drown. When I sit at the lake and envision a car submerging with two little boys, even if they aren't my own, I can't think of an instance where I wouldn't be actively trying to save them myself. Susan had a troubled life, and for that I do have compassion for her, but what she did was horrific. Do I think she could get out of prison and refrain from killing people? Yes, but I don't think that a 30-year sentence is enough of a punishment for such a heartbreaking crime.